thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, and I've been asked if I can present some work um, on integration of data. So we're talking about integrating hazard information with vulnerability and exposure information. Um, just to give you some background about what I do, so I'm not an operational meteorologist, I'm a researcher. So a lot of the work that I do is focused on the development of tools um, and research science that will help our forecasters to communicate the impacts and the risk. Um, as many of you will know, there is a whole wealth of information that comes out from all the forecasting systems that are available. And in a lot of circumstances, we find that our forecasters become overwhelmed with the amount of information. So one of the things that we try to do um, as researchers is to try and develop some tools that will help them in their processing of warnings. So um, the other thing I should mention is that the team that I work in at the Met Office is called the Weather Impacts Team. So we have a whole team of us that work on researching how do we do this type of work. Um, and so this work is a representation of what our team does. So it's not just me, there's, there's five or six others of us. Um, and then there's other teams around the office that work on these questions, but at different time scales. So at the seasonal time frame and at the climate time frame. So my first presentation is just going to be um, an overview, really. And I apologize if you think we're going backwards before we go forwards, but please bear with me. Um, the material that I just want to cover, and I just want to highlight this, is what do we mean by impact-based forecasting? And this is why I say, I'm sorry if it sounds like we're going backwards. <laughs> you think we've already done this. We're going to go one more time. Um, and then just a bit of an illustration of what the Met Office is doing um, from its National Severe Weather Warning Service. Um, and then coming back to this question of what do we actually mean by IBF, I'm going to go through a couple of options from a scientific perspective. So when we look at that matrix, what's actually under the hood from a scientific perspective? Um, and then how do we engage users? And what are the important things to consider for collaboration? So these are going to be the topics we cover. So what do we mean by impact-based forecasting? Now, as many of you know from history, we have predominantly, as meteorologists, been interested in telling people what the weather is going to be. Is it going to rain? Is it going to be windy? Um, and we're really eager to tell them how much rain and how windy. Um, but actually, often, what the user or the end person wants to know is, how does this affect me? Do I need to do something different? When do I need to do something different? Um, and this was one of the questions that came up after we had a very severe flood event in the UK, was are we actually answering those questions for our users? And actually, in a lot of circumstances, the answer was no, we weren't. So. What we are trying to do is move away from just asking and telling people what the weather will be, but trying to tell them what the weather is going to do and how they can do actions to mitigate against that. So in order for us to answer these questions, which is what the user wants to know, will the weather forecast affect me? Should I do something? When should I do something? We need to be looking at these things here. And sorry for Peru, who I'm now standing in front of. Um, so will the weather be hazardous? What assets could be impacted? How severely will the assets be impacted? And when are the assets going to be impacted? And something that I'd just like to make clear, because when there was discussion yesterday, we focused a lot on quantifying impact. One of the things that I'd like to put out to you, and maybe you don't agree, so it would be interesting, is that understanding what the impact will be is predominantly so that we can understand what actions and decisions need to be taken. If a warning is good and it's impact-oriented, then hopefully you're going to reduce the impacts. That's the aim. So if we're really focused on identifying what the impacts are from a forecasting perspective, then we're actually missing sort of the point about what we're trying to do it for. We're trying to get people 
to implement actions and decisions that will reduce the impacts we anticipate could happen. So I just wanted to clarify that. So the National Severe Weather Warning Service in the UK. So in the past, from 1988 to 2011, um, this was kind of the setup. We were issuing early warnings, flash warnings, emergency flash warnings. Um, we were doing it for these types of hazards. They were very hazard focused. It was very meteorologically oriented. Um, the kind of information that may not have been digestible by someone who does not work in a Met service. And so it was identified that this was too complicated people were not necessarily understanding what they should do when they get that message. And so after that time, we switched to what is now referred to as impact-based warnings. And I'm sure you're sick of seeing the matrix, <laughs> but this is what we are working with now. Um, and this is kind of what we have on our webpage. So what I wanna stress again here is it's not so much a question of being able to accurately predict what the impact is. We want to be able to tell people what the impacts might be so that they can act appropriately. Um, and the reason that this is important is that we need to be able to answer that question so that we are providing actionable and useful information. So in terms of hazard um, as a, in terms of impact-based forecasting, the kind of things we're looking at, um, and again, I'm not an operational meteorologist, but I'm sure many of you recognize this. <laughs> um, we are taking in lots of different hazard information. Now, this could be different models. Some could be deterministic. Some could be ensemble. You have graphical output. You have map output. So a whole wealth of information that you've got to deal with as a forecaster. But this would give you the hazard likelihood. Now, this part... I would say, if we're talking from a meteorological perspective, we feel fairly confident that we are mature in that sort of understanding. Does everybody agree? Hopefully, yes. Um, we feel confident that we can at least have an understanding of what the weather might be. The bit that is particularly underdeveloped from a meteorological perspective is the impact likelihood. So where do we get our vulnerability data? Where do we get our exposure data? How do we know when impacts are going to be severe, when they're not, where they're going to be, when they're not? Um, and in a lot of circumstances, this has been predominantly through expertise of those who work as an operational meteorologist. So you have, if you sat on a bench for a very long time, you may have become aware that certain areas are frequently high impacted by an event. And so you recognize that from your own intuition. You also know that at certain times of the day, rush hour in the UK, for example, you're more likely to have traffic disrupted by severe weather. Um, but this was not robustly included. It was not standard to do it. Not every forecaster had the same level of experience. Not every forecaster had worked in the same area. So these things were a lot more subjective. What we're aiming at with impact-based forecasting is to slightly and hopefully more than slightly, improve the robustness of this combination of things. We want to be able to get to a position where we can more routinely incorporate impact information into an understanding of risk output. So, what we hope to come out from the new system within our NSWWS is we have a headline. So it's a short headline, it describes the weather, which is what we are all, all good at. Um, and then what we would expect in terms of the impacts. So this is a generalized indication of um, what we might anticipate is going to happen. So disruption to your road network. You might be delayed on your way home. Um, you might have to delay your flight, these kind of things. Um, and then what should I do? So if you are going on holiday, should you get there earlier? Should you leave earlier? Do you need to account for more time on your journey? So these are the kind of things we might include here. And then any further details, so how long is this going to last? You know, how, what, what kind of additional things should you consider? Um, is there any other meteorological information that would be valuable? So is there other hazards that might also be concurrent to this one? So this would all be in there. 
And thank you to James for <laughs> highlighting these for us. Um, we have these impact tables, and this is how we are trying to move away from the subjective impact information that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, we have different tables, so this one is a generic, a generic impact level relative for all severe weather. Um, and the idea is that this will help forecasters be a little bit more strategic, a little bit more robust in the way that they handle impacts. Um, we have them also for each individual hazard. And as some of you may be aware, we've recently included new hazards into the National Severe Weather Warning Service. So we have thunderstorms in there now as well. Um, and so we'll have a, adjustments to the impact table to account for that also. And again, this, this is where we're looking at time of day, time of year, the antecedent conditions. So those are the ones that have happened before. Have you already had an event? Are you already at risk? Um, rural versus urban, and the other non-weather factors um, that might be important. And this is where we're talking about vulnerability and exposure. Now, I'm not sure if this was brought up earlier, so I just wanted to clarify it. How did we come about getting these impact tables? So, initially, um, as I say, a lot of the forecasters that we talked to they already had an understanding of what they thought was very low, what was low, what was medium, and what was high impact. And this was from their own intuition, their own experience of being forecasters in the UK. But the important thing was that this then related to what the emergency responders thought was the same level of impact. Um, and so we had a number of workshops in 2009 to 2010 where we invited responders to come to the Met Office and we discussed these tables with them. Um, we wanted to know whether very low for them equated to pretty much normal weather. Do they, do they agree with that? They can handle it. Is low impact a busy day for them? If so, then we're on the right track. Short-term strain on the emergency services or prolonged strain on emergency services. Out of those workshops, we were actually really happy. Um, this did line up. They agreed on a broad sense. There were some changes, I think, in some of the lower level parts. But generally, there was broad agreement that the responders agreed with this level of impact. And actually, we've collected a database now of around 4,000 different examples where responders have provided us with a case that illustrates where they're having impacts and how it fits into the table. So we can relate back to that. Um, the other thing I would like to stress is that these workshops that we had in 2009, 2010, we had them again years after and again in 2015. And the reason for doing that is that obviously their resilience, their capacity, their ability to respond changes over time. So doing this sort of engagement once is not sufficient. You need to continually update that engagement to account for the fact that they may now be in a position that what used to be a medium impact for them now might be a low because they're actually at a better capacity level. They can actually handle that level of impact better. So it's worth bearing that in mind. So the process within the National Severe Weather Warning Service at the Met Office. So first of all, you get all your, you get your forecast of severe weather. And that comes from your models. Um, and some of the questions that we would consider here is the forecast uncertainty. As I say, we have numerous models, some deterministic, some ensemble. Um, the impact uncertainty, uh, again, that still remains somewhat subjective, but you go back to the tables, you review the tables. Um, the intensity of the weather, the time of day, time of year, the location. Um, is that normal for that area? Which is an interesting question because obviously we're looking at um, forecasting over, I think if I haven't got a picture right now, but if you saw they're not on the county boundaries, the blobs, the warning blobs. Um, and so you might have a warning area that covers multiple administrative boundaries and they have different capacities to be able to respond. So it's worth bearing that in mind in the, in the decision making. Um, local vulnerabilities and the recent conditions, as I mentioned before. Now, the important thing is that once, this, once you have these forecasts, you need to answer these questions in relation to your civil contingencies, or civil protection, I think, is how you refer to them here. Um, 
And so there is a dialogue between the forecasters and the civil contingencies advisors. And basically what they're trying to do is identify where to put the tick in the box. <laughs> so it's not a, um, it's, not, it's not kind of a scoring system, although they have an intuition about where they would want to put it from a forecast perspective. They also recognize that there is expertise in these areas from responders and civil contingencies that will be able to more robustly identify where the tick in the box should go. Um, so once we've had this dialogue, then we can finalize and issue the warning and say, in this case, it was a, a medium. Um, and then it's what's worth bearing in mind also is that although this issuance happens once, you're going to be updating it. So this process has to continue again. We will also then be doing monitoring of the weather forecast and the impacts. Now, um, I had, there was a couple of questions, I think, yesterday around real-time impact information. Now, in a lot of circumstances, because this dialogue is happening, and it's happening on a regular basis throughout the generation of the warning, a lot of this impact information is being delivered via this consultation process. And this is happening on a regular basis throughout the generation of the warning. Obviously, not all impacts are captured through that. But because that dialogue line is open and they're being able to talk with people who are directly in the area that's being affected, um, some of that impact information for evaluation is there. You then review this warning and then you might go back to the civil contingencies and say, Am I, are we right? Is this, is this what we really think? Is this still the situation? Do we need to update it? Now, as you can see, that's quite a long process. It's not, it's not necessarily a short process, particularly if you have some very opinionated people in the room who definitely want one approach and someone else wants something else. So um, some of the work that I do is to try and help with this process, and I'll go into that in a second. So where do we find warning information? Um, and I think this has been shown before. Um, we obviously have the public website, television and radio. We have a hazard manager web service, which is specifically for our responder, category one and two responders. Um, uh, social media um, and email alerts as well. We also have direct dialogue with certain expert users, so they can also provide feedback. Um, the thing that I would say is that we have a continual feedback process on these warnings that are issued. So we will be having dialogue with responders. And that happens on a regular basis. So we'll have that on an annual basis. Um, we also, after extreme events, will get in touch with the public and send out surveys to see how they felt that the warning was issued. Did it produce useful information? How could we have improved, et cetera? And so that feedback process is really helpful to know that we are continually able to produce useful information. Um, and I haven't got slides here, but if anyone is interested, we actually have some of the data related to that, and that, that might be useful for you. So going back to what do we mean by impact-based forecasting? This is one, one way of doing impact-based forecasting, using the impact tables. And the main thing that I want to stress is that there are lots of different options. So what do you want your impact-based forecast or warning to provide? Do you need to communicate the impacts, the risk, or the action that the user should take? Do you want to provide quantitative assessments of the potential consequences? So do you need to actually provide information on the monetary losses? the damages? Do you need to provide that in numerical information? Or is a qualitative assessment OK, so low, medium, high? Do people know what that means? Are you doing a communication to a specific sector or asset? Or are you being more generalized? Do you need to consider multi and cascading hazards? And if so, do you need to then look at those impacts as well? And the information that's provided to users, is it provided with a specific time frame in mind? And when I say that, it's because the action that needs to be taken will have a certain time that needs to be taken before the event. So for example, if you are trying to get a flight, then there's a certain amount of time where you have to make a decision 
about whether you're going to go to the airport or not go to the airport. If you get told five minutes before and you're already at the airport, that's no use to you at all. So it's about timeliness. Sorry. It's about timeliness. Um, and to answer these questions, we have to engage our users. Um, and I think everybody has already highlighted that. So, so as I said, the, the actual feed that goes into an impact-based forecast and what feeds into that matrix that I know you were all working on earlier, underneath that, there's a lot of different scientific options that you can do. Um, and I just want to highlight some of those because the impact tables are one way. But as I said, the process by which you would generate a warning from that can remain subjective and it can remain laborious in some respects. So one of the things we were asked to do by um, our forecasters was whether there were ways to integrate data so that there could be a more automated approach to calculating risk so that there could be more information that they could look at without having to necessarily go through a continual dialogue process. So this is, it looks very similar, which is good. <laughs> um, so this is an automated first guess warning system. And my colleague, Rob Neal, works on this. Um, and this is a way that we can provide a first guess assessment about where we think impacts are likely to be. So this is before it goes to a forecaster. It's not, this, isn't, this is seen by a forecaster, but they don't integrate with it until later. Um, and it produces an output like this. And again, this looks like a scoring system that we might all recognize. But this is all done without any influence from an outside source, in the sense that we might have, in, we might have discussed this with forecasters before, but this is all automated. Um, this is recognizable to a forecaster, and it's related exactly to the matrix they would then see. So they can review this as a first guess. Um, but the thing I want to highlight is that in this instance, we have very distinct likelihood thresholds on this side, and this is derived from a probability, um, from an ensemble, sorry. And then this level of impact is not actually determined by vulnerability and exposure, and that's what I wanted to highlight. The impact is actually assess using thresholds that are regionally, seasonally, or antecedent condition specific. So this, for me, is something that used to happen in the Met Office um, a lot more. It's the use of um, meteorological thresholds to pseudo-derive impact, as I would call it. So let's just have a look. So for example, here, um, if we go to, I think rain is a good one. So on the rainfall, we have a separation here between unsaturated ground and saturated ground. And we also have regional splits. So we recognize that different thresholds for different regions are likely to lead to different levels of impact. Now, this hasn't necessarily been based on an impact assessment. It's not related to vulnerability or exposure. This is purely based on um, the thresholds being recognizable as climatological thresholds almost. Um, and so we can have this also for snow. Um, so you have a low impact, medium impact, high impact. And then for the highlands region, this varies from five centimeters up to 30 centimeters. And this just tries to um, capture the fact that we recognize different parts of the UK, and I'm sure in your country, are already very capable of dealing with a natural hazard that they're used to having. So for example, for us, a wind gust um, in Scotland, they are very used to getting windy conditions up there. They're, they're very used to it. In the south, in London, the same wind gust could be very damaging and very impactful. And so this is the use of a climatological type threshold to, to tease out impact. But as I say, it's not specifically related to vulnerability and exposure at this point. So this is one way, and it feeds into a matrix. So this is another approach. Uh, me and my colleague, Helen Titley, work on this. Um, so this is the global hazard map. Now, we have a global guidance unit in the Met Office, um, and this is something that we try to develop to help them in the development of a guidance um, assessment, a global guidance assessment that they issue on a day basis. So the aim... Ooh, 
Sorry. The aim is to summarize the risk of high impact weather across the globe. Um, we have a number of different um, hazards that we include. So we have precipitation, wind and snow, tropical cyclones, heat waves and cold waves. Um, and the main thing is that we try and summarize a seven day forecast at the very front of the map for a forecaster. So the idea is they'll look at this and they'll see, oh, there's a blob of rain there. What is that? I need to look into that in more detail. So you can then drill down into this and you can have a look at the gridded probability fields and, and assess whether that is an important event that you want to consider. The next thing is that we recognize that hazards in and of themselves do not necessarily guarantee an impact. So although we have a forecast here of a heavy rainfall event, we might also be interested to know that it's near a highly populated area. And so you can put different layers of information under this, like population density, fragility states, which is something that gives an indication of how fragile a state is to being able to respond, um, and also things like recent earthquakes and other hazards. Um, and we can put this all in one portal so that you can compare the information across. So this becomes very useful. We had an event, um, a tropical cyclone event, where we had the track information, which is here. And what you also wanted to look at was, okay, where's the rainfall in relation to that track? Because if it's offset from the track, the impacts are actually going to be felt where that rainfall is falling, flooding, for example. We also had strong winds, so where are they? Well, you can overlay all of this together on a single product, and the forecaster can quickly look at that and look at it in relation to different vulnerability and exposure layers. No calculations are done, but it allows a forecaster to visually interpret the information and come to a subjective assessment of risk. So this, for example, was Winter Storm Jonas. And I just want to highlight that these were the polygon forecasts. So this was the summary. So we've got um, a day four and a day five forecast. Um, and as you can see, if this polygon here is not over New York, whereas this one does. So you can have a look very quickly there that population densities will be, you know, worsely affected. There'll be worse effects from the event if it spreads over this area than potentially this area here. So this was very useful from a forecaster perspective because when they're trying to do the global um, assessment sheet, they also use the matrix, but they don't necessarily have all of the information about vulnerability and exposure for all parts of the world. But being able to have it in this portal, they're then able to feed it in when they issue this guidance statement. So this is another way of doing it. Again, no calculations. Now, this is where we get into the, the challenging bit. So hazard impact modeling. So this is something that our team's been working on for a few years now. Um, and a lot of questions have come up around data availability, and I'll come into that later. But the idea between hazard impact modeling is that you are trying to actively engage with risk. You are trying to calculate it properly. <laughs> um, so we're looking at identifying the hazard. We're looking at identifying the vulnerability. And we're looking at identifying the exposure. And from that, we want to be able to communicate the risk of something occurring. And at the moment, what we do is we put this into a daily hazard assessment. Um, and this will be for many different um, hazard events. So we've got in this. The British Geological Survey participates, uh, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, the Environment Agency, the Health and Safety Laboratory. We've got um, Ordnance Survey, Public Health England. We have all of those people engaged in this project and this partnership. And it allows us to be able to develop these models. So we'll come on to this in a bit more detail in the next presentation. But just to highlight the important things to remember, what we're really trying to do is quantify in a robust way to support our forecasters how we get to this risk. So we have an ensemble forecast of surface water flooding, for example. We have a one kilometer impact assessment. In this instance, these are calculated offline from, an, uh, from um, 
a process which I'll go into again later, but these are actual impacts counts. So which buildings have been affected, which um, railways, which transport sectors could be affected. Then we are able to generate a regional summary of those impacts. And then from that, we can populate this matrix. Now, the reason that we, the, we're very keen on this is because although we recognize that having collaboration at the stage of issuing warning is really valuable, it can also be timely um, and can mean that we cannot get forecasts out necessarily as quickly as we might want to. So this approach, sorry, ooh, this approach allows us to produce sort of a first guess risk assessment that can then be used by the forecaster and then they can discuss this output with their users and their responders. Um, and we found it so far through trialing to be very useful. It's, it's moved, a, it's advanced quite quickly actually, this one. So this is another approach. It's more complicated than the other two, but it, it's proving to be quite useful. So the next thing is that we have also had a lot of interest in being able to extend forecasting. Um, as you all know, um, there are a lot of um, impacts that require responses before we can realistically issue a warning. So if, for example, um, we need to evacuate people, there needs to be a quite a fair amount of lead time in that because you know it's not easy to chivy people out of their homes. They don't necessarily want to leave. Um, so one of the things we've been looking at is how do we extend um, high impact weather warnings? Um, this is some work again that we've been focusing on um, with my colleague Robert Neal. So this is using weather pattern forecasts. So here we have a number of weather patterns which are termed regimes here. Um, but we're able to forecast these synoptic patterns out to 15 days ahead or further actually. Um, and in these circumstances you can then look at the transition, you can look at what the type of weather pattern is, and you can actually start directly relating these to impacts. And this allows you to extend your impact forecast further in advance. I would stress you really need to have a probabilistic system to be able to do this, because obviously we recognize that uncertainty over time grows. So. so these are some of the things that have been developed based on that product. We have coastal flooding. So this is using the weather patterns. So we've been able to relate to those 30 patterns that I showed you in that table, um, which of those relate to coastal flooding events around the UK. So this is where we've had overtopping, coastal flooding events. There are specific weather patterns that are likely to lead to higher, higher risk of that. We also have fluvial flooding, um, a product for fluvial flooding, and we also have a product for landslides. Um, this one is just being developed with the British Geological Survey. And then this one is, a, is an interesting one, but when we had the um, volcanic ash, we had, a, we had an earth, a, a volcano in Iceland, one of the big questions for, uh, that was asked of us was, well, when will people be able to fly again? The airlines wanted to know, when can we go into this airspace? And one of the things that was asked is, well, we need to know which, um, when will there be ash in our airspace? And so looking at the synoptic signatures and the flow from Iceland, we were able to say with some certainty or not whether there would be flows of ash coming from that direction. Now, what I stress again is this hashed area, if you can see on each of these, uh, not so much on that one, on this one, this is where you would use a higher resolution forecast. So you, this is staggering your warning information. Um, and we'll discuss that a bit more. So the other thing is then um, extending again, so seasonal. So there's been a lot of work from um, our seasonal team, um, Erica and Emily, uh, to relate uh, different large scale weather patterns to impacts. So transport impact data, we would then look at relating that to um, NAO, and then we would be able to run Hindcast to look at how that relationship grows. From that relationship, we can then start to develop forecast transport impacts um, out to three months ahead. And these are some of the products that they're developing. 
Um, so this one just illustrates the comparison between what you might expect for a typical winter um, and then what's forecast for this winter. And this is in terms of the impacts. So from this, you would populate this um, outlook, seasonal outlook. Now, the, the big thing is that you really need to have good impact data for this. <laughs> and I know we mentioned this has been a big topic. Where do we get this impact data from? And we'll come on to that in a bit. But yes, you have to have a good relationship to be able to take these kind of forecasts forward. So uh, final few slides for this presentation. Engaging users and building collaborations. Um, and as we've said, data is a really big issue when you're talking about vulnerability, when you're talking about exposure, when you're talking about impacts. These kind of things can only really come from those people who are expert in understanding those data. And as we found, that doesn't always mean it's a meteorologist. It might be civil protection. It might be a totally different organization. So for landslides, British Geological Survey are the people who would hold that data. Um, and so we need to really build partnerships and engage with our users. So I want to go back to these questions. If we want to understand um, how we should be communicating, what we should be displaying, which assets and sectors we should be engaging with, then we really need to um, open up our doors <laughs> to lots of different organizations. So when we go for engagement, this is something that we've been doing a lot um, recently, actually, when we go to different international countries. We want to ask these sort of things. First of all, what are the impacts of severe weather that you're facing? And what, are the, what weather or hazard is associated with these impacts? What are the actions that you could take to potentially reduce those impacts? Forecasts. How well can we forecast that hazard, given that you've told us it causes great impact? And one of the things here is that, do you have forecast skill to be able to do that? That's another question. The decisions, if we're going round this in this way, um, how can this forecast information be used to support action? Now, at this point, you're, you need to have this open dialogue with your end user, your responder, and your meteorologist. And you need to be able to say, realistically, if, I, if you were given this forecast at this lead time with this level of skill, what could you do with it? Could you do anything? Or could you do lots of things? Um, the next step is then to ask around communication. And I think we've talked a lot about this. How can the forecast be communicated and disseminated? Um, the important thing here is that you have those channels open, that you, they are aware of them, that you are aware of them, and that the style of communication is appropriate for the action that should be taken. Um, finally, evaluation. Um, this was something, again, up here. What action, what action was taken by those responders? Uh, and were the impacts reduced? But also, have you got the data to be able to do that evaluation routinely? It does, you can't just be a one-off. It has to be something that's routine. And so you have to have a structure in mind for how you're going to collect that data and how you're going to use that data. So this kind of engagement can be done through workshops, which is often how we do it when we're engaging with other um, groups. Or it can be done through collaboration, through projects, through existing projects. So as I've mentioned before, um, a lot of the work that we've done for the hazard impact modeling portion has been done under the Natural Hazard Partnership. Now, this was established in 2011. The reason it was established was predominantly because we had a huge flooding event in the UK in 2007, where there was a really big issue about communication between organizations. And unfortunately, I think this is often how this happens. A big event happens, and somebody says, why were you not providing us this information? Why did we not have knowledge of this? Um, and I think all of us woke up and said, yes, that is a very good point. Why were we not doing that? Um, so 
We've been pulling together a partnership. There are 17 different organizations that fall under this partnership. Um, and the aim is to bring together these organizations so that we can coherently and coordinate advice for government, but also so that we can um, establish an exchange of knowledge between us, because we're all from different backgrounds. So we've got, um, as I said before, geological survey, uh, we have flooding, we have um, food and rural affairs, uh, public health England, we have health and safety laboratory, um, which are now health and safety executive, sorry. Um, and the aim is that we exchange our knowledge, we grow our understanding, um, and we work together to push forward the science that will enable us to do hazard impact modeling better and impact-based forecasting better. Um, that, I think, was one of the biggest things that came out of that. So, in summary, um, I just wanted to highlight that although we talk about that matrix as a standalone thing, there is a lot of different options that you can employ. And it may be that for a certain sector and for a certain responder, a different approach is more suitable to them. And it's just to be aware of that. You don't always have to follow a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, also, really important, engaging with your end users, which I'm sure you're already aware of, <laughs> um, but also how to necessarily do that and how regularly you need to be doing it. Um, and also to understand where we need to be for impact, vulnerability, exposure data. If you choose to go down that route, then where do we get that data from? And how important is collaboration in achieving that? And from my perspective, I don't think we would have been able to do half the things we've done from a research perspective without collaboration. So that's just from our perspective. Um, and I just wanted to highlight one thing, because I know there's quite a few of you here who have already started down this route and are doing impact-based forecasting. And I've been so impressed with all the work that you guys have been doing. And I really wanted to highlight that there is a project within um, WMO uh, the high weather, the high impact weather project. Um, I'm part of a team that's looking at impacts, vulnerability, and risk. We have a number of activities, but one which I think would be really useful to have some of you guys inputting into is that we are doing a review and classification of impact modeling. So if there are anybody here who has already started developing IVF methods, and if there's anybody that would be really interested to get involved in that piece of work, then we would love to hear from you. Equally, we have pieces of work around um, impact model into comparison work, which may be, may be a little bit further away. Um, and also looking at unconventional data sources for impact modeling, evaluation, and communication. So again, if there's anybody in the room who would be interested in engaging with that, we are all ears and would love to have you. So um, that is the end of this presentation. So if there are any questions, go ahead. <laughs> or if I've scared you all equally. <laughs> Gracias. Eh.